Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. <laughs> Ain't a fucking. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't want you to play it, but lower it. Are we going to straighten out? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Next! Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! All right, happy Monday, everybody. What's Phil? up? Yeah, Phil and John here from the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. We're feeling okay today. How are you feeling, man? I feel better than I should. Well, <laughs> I feel better than James Brown. <laughs> that, what about, is, did we ever come to the realization, was that Melvin Parker that played on that track? I believe so. I think he played on Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, too. We have a brand new bag this week, that's for sure. We do. And... We have an interview for you folks with the great Joel Rosenblatt, who, kind of true to our roots, we're bringing you somebody who deserves uh, greater recognition, don't you think, John? No doubt about that. And on top of that, we are forging new ground here at the Drummer's Weekly Groove Cast. This is our first shot at doing a remote interview on Skype, and dare I say, it went off without a hitch. I love it. Sounds good. No, uh, no issues whatsoever. Yeah. Thanks to Phil and his diligent research and such. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I had this uh, rig put together with like duct tape and chewing <laughs> gum, man, making sure that it would work. But it turned out, didn't it? It turned out great. You know, and, and you guys won't be able to, of course, see this since you're listening to it. But this we actually had Joel on video and uh, it worked flawlessly, man. It worked out really well. Thanks for being the guinea pig, Joel. I, boy, welcome to the future. <laughs> you know, we were able to do this thing. Joel is up in New York, and of course, we're down in Atlanta. And so we were able to uh, successfully get this thing done. And uh, I think that everybody's going to, if you've ever, if you know Joel and you know about his playing, um, I'm going to say that any preconceived notions you might have about this guy are going to be shattered by the time you get done with this. And I mean this in a very positive way. This guy was more than open to anything we had to ask him and did not disappoint. Yeah, man. It was cool. Um, you know, real honest about the reality of uh, what he does and his insecurities even. So it was really refreshing in that sense. We're going to go ahead and get this show going. And... Uh, you can find us on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash drummers weekly groovecast. You can tweet us if you're a fellow who likes 140 characters or less at twitter.com forward slash DW groovecast or just at DW groovecast as the kids are wont to do. And you can also reach us at our proper email address, drummers weekly groovecast at gmail.com. John, if you don't have anything else, let's talk to Joel. I love it. Let's get to it. All right. See you on the other side.
Welcome, Groovecast Nation. Excited today to uh, chat with a drummer's drummer. Fella I met a number of years ago through, believe it or not, Fred Vigdor, <laughs> who was our connection with uh, Adam Deitch. This Fred Vigdor guy, man, he, he needs to get stock in the company before it becomes a public offering, don't you I'm think? I'm telling you, man. Anyway, um, Joel Rosenblatt is our guest today and uh, has just an amazing and diverse resume. Uh, certainly well-respected in drumming circles and beyond. Uh, done a lot of cool gigs, and we're going to get into all that. Um, so enough of my rambling. Joel, welcome. Hi, guys. Good to be here. Glad to have you. It's also probably the appropriate time to say that we are breaking new ground here on the show. This is our first remote interview. Yep. And oh, really? This it is. is it. When you did Adam, it was live. You did, he was in the studio? We actually, man, went to Athens, Georgia, and uh, which is not that far, you know, from Atlanta, and we we actually did the show on the bus. Oh, I got you. Yeah, yeah. With, you, with, with lettuce, correct? That's right. Okay, got it. Great band, man. Jeez. And he knows Fred. He played with uh, Average White Band for a while. You know, I had a steady gig. This is years and years ago in Nyack, New York, where Adam is from, mm -hmm. and he reminded me years later that when he was twelve years old, and I remember this. So a parent came, you know, Bobby, uh, I think his father's Bobby. That's right. Um, said, you know, my son's a drummer. Can he sit behind you? And for like two or three gigs, it was a weekly gig. And I had this little kid sitting behind me, and that was Adam. That's incredible. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that's it is pretty whack, definitely. To state the obvious, it is a small world. And, that's right. And he's done well for himself, man. It was, it was a great oh, hang and good Yo. guy. Band, every, we met all the band, super cool guys. So it was it was a great experience. Yeah, we got to hear about, it was a little over an hour of the sound check, man, and they were killing it. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, man, you want to? Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and put his and, feet to the fire. Yeah, we'll go ahead and throw out the first salvo here. Um, so, Joel, what we like to do on this show that's a little bit different from some of the other uh, podcasts and interviews is we don't like to spend a whole lot of time on like early childhood stuff. We like to, just touch on it a little bit and then jump more into like uh, serious study and then professional life. But we do want to get just a little modicum of background. Um, I noticed from reading some of your stuff online that originally you started out as a trumpet player. And right. yeah, and it was chiefly due to an influence that your brother had. It seemed like he, he was really into Tijuana brass. That's right. right. And so... <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about you played trumpet for a while, and then it's my understanding that I guess it was by the time you got to middle school, you kind of had your first interaction with drums and drumming. And just tell us then briefly how you got into that, and then how you had your first lessons on drums and who you studied with. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I started on trumpet for two reasons. My brother was playing Herb Alpert all the time, and I think... <clears throat> I think what you know. I think when you when I grew up, when you start drums, it's like I think you're in third grade or something, like eight or nine years old. And I don't even think drums was offered. It was either you had to either play a string instrument or a brass or something. Um, it wasn't even on my radar. Um, so I started with trumpet, and I was into it. I mean, you know, I was playing, but you know, there was no imp impro improvising at that point. But when I was uh, when I got into seventh or eighth grade, um, there was this girl that I had a crush on who played drums. I swear this is and and I kind of faked an interest in drums. <laughs> hey, like what? Hey, that's kind of cool, you know, just to kind of talk to her. <laughs> um, and that's that's is that a drummer like a budding drummer or what? Right? <laughs> a dog is a dog, you know. That's right. Um, but long story short is. Um, she lost interest, and I ended up buying her drum set, or my parents did that, um, and that's how I kind of started. And my high school band director, uh, I went to school in Verona, New Jersey, and that, that high school had a stellar music program. And I would not be a musician if it wasn't for that music program and my band director named Harry Owens, who's still alive and in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, retired and everything. But 
Um, as all elementary school teachers, you know, they have to play all the instruments. But but his his main instrument personally was drums. And he, even though I was playing trumpet at the time and just fooling around on drums, he recognized I had a talent. And I took my first lessons were actually with him. He kind of showed me how to hold the sticks. I remember going to his basement and we were playing, uh, you know, Stan Kenton charts and Woody Herman stuff. And, and I played in the high school jazz band as a drummer while still playing French horn in the concert band. And in the marching band, I played snare drum a little bit too, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I went off to college, I didn't own that French horn. You know, that was owned by the school. When I went off to college, um, I gave that up and I was I was full time drums. Cool, man. Um, so regarding those first lessons, he showed you basic technique, like how to hold the sticks and that type thing. Did he also get you into like proper methods as no. well at that time? No. Okay, gotcha. Not that I can remember. It was just, you know, uh, he, that's why I started holding traditional grip and we did some some work out of the Chapin book. Uh, and this is very early on. And, and honestly, I don't remember a lot of the mechanics what he was telling me. I remember he was a ball buster, uh, which was good. But then I kind of gave up and I was self-taught for a long time. Like I, I wasn't even, <clears throat> you know, even concerned with that. I was kind of having fun. And I had a lot of natural talent and I skated on that for a long time mm -hmm. in, until, and you know, we got to bring this up until I met Weckl, who completely who? kicked my ass. Yeah, it's this guy, <laughs> man. He's up and coming. <laughs> but he, he put me he made me realize that I, I need to get my shit together. Okay. Now that, that, that is an interesting question or an interesting topic that you brought up. Now you're in Jersey. How did you meet, how did you meet Dave? We, I was recruited by Neil Slater, who's now the director of North Texas state with the, with the best music program in the country. One of them at the time he was, um, he was teaching at Bridgeport. Um, and like many colleges, they go around and they recruit, like the, the, the A band will go around to high schools and stuff and play concerts and they actually recruit. And my, and they came to my high school because like I said, my, my band director was very forward thinking, was one of the best bands in the state. I was all state, all region, all that stuff, you know, as a drummer. And, um, Neil noticed me and said, Hey, you should come to my school, blah, blah, blah. I ended up doing that as a freshman. The one of the first freshmen ever to make the A band in college, right? Nice. So I was like, my ego is, you know, I had no idea of anything. And then I heard that there's this new kid coming in from St. Louis in the in the spring semester, which was Weckl. And uh, that's when everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so good story. So now prior to going to Bridgeport, you had been primarily self-taught aside from your teacher that you had in high school at that time. That's or, right. Or, or, okay. So you and I have some common ground here from the standpoint that, that I studied with Ed Sof a bit. Yep. And then yep. also where I went to undergraduate school, one of his teaching protégés was who I studied with for, for four years as well. So I know a good, good bit about Ed. So when you first got to school then and met Ed, for anybody who doesn't really know him that much, just give us a little bit about, I'm sure you were, let me just say this, I'm sure you were in for a bit of a shock then from that standpoint that you had not studied that many methods other than like Chapin, and then all of a sudden you meet Ed. Yeah, I mean, Ed, when I went to meet Ed, he, told, he I found out that I was doing everything wrong. And this is from me, you know, my thing about teachers is everything a teacher says, I always take with a grain of salt because whatever worked for them worked for them because of who they are and they developed this thing that, that allowed them to be excellent players. The same method may not work for everybody for various reasons. It could be that, you know, the physical strength, the stature, all those things. Um, but at, that, at the time when I was uh, 17 or 18, when I met Ed, you know, I didn't know any of that. And he, he, basically tore me down and for the first time ever I was not thinking about wow this feels good or hey man this is fun I was thinking about am I doing this correctly and correct right and wrong had never really come into my 
you know, I had never even thought about that. It was just like, man, I was like, you know, grooving, thinking I was grooving, whatever it was in, in, in high school or college. And I was having fun and I was playing from the heart, you know. And when I met Ed, all of a sudden I was using my brain and thinking about like, am I sitting at the right height? Is my elbow moving? You remember all the elbow stuff, Phil, right? Sure. Like, you know, if you wanted me to play heel down, I, that was really uncomfortable for me. Um, so that was a whole thing. And then to make matters worse, um, Ed was only there for one semester, and then he split. And I was like in the middle of trying to figure stuff out, and, and I was kind of left high and dry. Mm. But, uh, you know, he he really got me thinking about the mechanics of drums. It was it was very cool. I wish I could have studied more with him, but but then he, he I think that's when he went to Texas. Gotcha, yeah. Um, at that time when you were in school, did you study like uh, the, we'll call them like the large popular methods like the syncopation book, go through the rest of the Chapin, new breed, stick control, that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, I can't really remember what I was studying with Ed, probably the Chapin thing. In fact, I'm sure of it. Um, and I don't remember if we were doing hand stuff. He was kind of focusing on my, you know, my grip and stuff like that. And again, it was a long time ago and only for like four months. But the interesting thing is the next teacher that came in was Randy Jones from uh, Brubeck. I think he just passed uh, a few years ago. This guy, I credit really to my philosophy how I play now because I've told this story many times at clinics, but I just come back from winter vacation. Ed is now gone and there's a new teacher and I'm already freaked out because my confidence is shaking because Ed's telling me how much, how, how much stuff I needed to work on and things like that. And I came in and there's Randy Jones sitting in, in there and uh, before I even play anything, I'm saying, all right, how do my hands look? Am I sitting at the right height? Is my foot, what's the pedal? You know, I was having all these technical questions for him. And he looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and he just said, I don't care how you do anything. I don't care if you're match grip or tr traditional grip. You sit high, low, uh, you know, standing on your head. I only care what it sounds like. And that was like, that stopped me in my tracks because that's really where I was at. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe if, if you can develop a sound in your head that's the hardest thing. And then your body is going to develop whatever technique it needs to get that sound. And that's what we were doing with Randy. It's like he would play quarter notes or swing in the ride. He just played it with swing and I'd play it sound like horrible. And then we would work on like, what makes my, why does he, his time swing? Why does mine not? And we just work on that. And in some lessons I would show up and, and he'd say, let's not play. Let's go to lunch. And we would talk about, like, what are you listening to? What, what are you thinking about? You know, when you're playing, are you listening to the trumpet player, the lead trumpet? Are you playing with the bass player? It was the, the, a way more musical approach. We never worked on technique, not one time. Maybe. It was all about, let's play this. Why doesn't it sound good? Let's make it sound good. So, Joel, when you were, uh, again, uh, up there at, at Connecticut Bridgeport, how did you like the music classes? Did you like theory, ear training, music history, that kind of thing? No, no. and that's why I left. Because I, I just wanted to play. In, you know, in hindsight, I wish I'd stayed. Um, especially now as, you know, I'm not really a writer. And part of part of the reason is, is I don't really have the tools. Um but, uh, you know, if even though I was a jazz performance major, you still had to learn, you know, I was like trying to practice marimba and I was trying to practice trombone and I was trying to practice. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? I just want to be shedding. Um, and I was starting to gig a little bit and, and uh, you know, I had loans I knew I had to pay back. So after after two and a half years, I bailed. Always saying I could go back, you know what I mean? But, but, uh, but I never did. So, Joel, real quick. Um, just in that time, high, late high school, into college, who were you digging on, like your influences and drum heroes at this point? Who was shaping your approach in that? I was totally, I was not in any garage bands. I wasn't playing any rock. I was I was a total jazz nerd, but big band. Like I was, I wanted to play in Stan Kenton's band. I wanted, in fact, I went in high school, I went to a jazz camp where the Woody Herman band was in residence and John Raleigh was playing drums. 
And John and I kind of like went off into the corner. I mean, look, John, he's only, he's probably only five or six years older than me. So if I was 17, he was probably in his early 20s. And he was amazing. And, and I, you know, I was all into Woody Herman. I just wanted to play big band. I could read pretty well because I, from my trumpet background. Um, so I, if you can read regular music, reading a drum chart is, is super easy. Mm-hmm. Because you don't have any melody or articulation to work about. It's just rhythms. And it was amazing to me that all, all the music I'd ever played on trumpet, everything was written out. This is what you play. But when you have a drum chart, you got slashes. It's like, do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, to me, that was amazing. It's like, here's the time. I mean, here's the tempo and here's the feel. You know, now make up your own shit. Yeah. A figure I'm, here or there you need to be mindful of and other than that. Yeah, well, that that's where the musician the musician part comes in. But you're not limited by, um, you know, what's on the page. It's it's really kind of amazing, you know. Not a lot of uh, other other uh, maybe bass players have that liberty as well, where they just have the chords and the slashes. But um, I thought that was fantastic. So uh, yeah, that's that's how that went down. And while you were at Bridgeport, you mentioned that when you got in as a freshman, you made it straight up to the A band, right? Yeah. What right. other what other ensembles did you play in, or or what kind of value also did you get? from playing in those ensembles because one of the things i always tell all my students because it was it was certainly the case for me that the, the ensembles the small groups the big bands the studio stuff that i played in school man that was that's invaluable stuff i mean you get to play right. all the time well you know back in the 70s <laughs> back in the 70s <laughs> so, so so joel just as a timeline thing here this was like the late 70s in, yeah in i was in school from 78 to 80 gotcha in, in college okay okay so no recording department, you know, recording was still for, for the, well, you know, you had million dollar studios that wasn't even, you know, I remember, you know, the first Walkman came out when I was in college, you know, there was no slow down machines. There was none of that stuff. I mean, um, the, the, the good news of that is, well, you talked about ensembles. The only ensemble I was in, I was in the big band. I mean, uh, you know, the regular full stage band. And there were some small group ensembles where we played like Chameleon and stuff like that, you know. Um, and that was all fun. But I started to get a little recording experience by just doing demos. Because, but you know, back then there was no such thing as a drum machine. So if, if you were going to do a demo, you had to hire drummers. So, you know, I would do the demos and work with a little click track and, you know, I would never get called for finals. That would be like somebody else. But I got some experience, which I think kids now, they don't really have that. I mean, the only experience they have is to play with play alongs, which, again, you're using a click and you're playing with, with stuff. But it's so sterile. There's no there's no. Um, you know, if you're playing with a play along after three or four times, you got that thing memorized, you know, the solo, you know, everything. And then then the whole the whole conversation is dead. You know, th- that's what I find with, with kids now is like, they don't have experience to like when the shit hits the fan on, on the gigs and, you know, you got to follow somebody who made a left turn. You got to do this and you got to change your, you, you want the bass player now playing 12, eight, you got to adapt. You got to do all these things on the fly. You know, that's really hard to practice these days. Yeah. You know, well, sometimes, go ahead. sometimes even just two different bass players and, you know, Making that work is something that I, I seem it seems to be lost with kids at this point. It's locked into the grid and the you know loops and all this stuff. So it's an interesting. Absolutely, it, you know, and and that that's a real thing. I think a lot of feel um, is absent from a lot of pop music now, for obvious reasons. Because, um, but there's some exciting stuff happening now, like. Like kids, especially, I know I live in New York, so there, there's a lot of cutting edge stuff and it's, it's kind of exciting, mm-hmm. but, but, and, and it's interesting because the technique of kids now is just mind blowing. I mean, the bar is so high now. I can't even touch what these 20 year olds are doing technique wise. The only thing I have over them is experience and maybe knowing what not to play. Mm-hmm. And that that's a thing, you know, um, 
But, you know, even the audience now, I mean, even, you know, with the gospel chops and everything, I mean, it's the stuff is so exciting. People want to see that. They really want to see it. And, and that's that shit is really amazing. I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on. But, uh, you know, to me, to my mind, you know, it's bordering on really overplaying. I mean, if I played like that on any of my gigs, I'd get the, I'd get shown the door. You know, um, so. You know, it's 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 an interesting time for drumming because the the technique is so so high, but I think. Mm. Hold on a second. I'll call back. Um, I think I think it might have been from me. No, no. that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's it's um, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not. I've never been a technique guy. I've always been a feel guy. Um, and I think for some gigs now, you know, they really want a visual thing and I'm not a visual drummer. I like to be in the back and just, just laying it down. Yeah. Yeah. So now we'll go ahead and, and kind of morph into professional life, man. So you were, you were at Yukon Bridgeport for a couple of years. What made you leave? Uh, I got an offer to go on the road. Um, and I really want to, it was with Fred actually. You know, Fred, it was with Matt Guitar Murphy. Um, and uh, I really wanted to do it. And, and uh, you know, I, I traveled the country, you know, in a Cadillac, in a van. It was just like the Blues Brothers movie. That's what it was. Uh, and I got some amazing experience from that. And, and more importantly, I got amazing life experience. I mean, Matt, if you don't know who Matt is, you know, he's, he's a, a renowned blues guitarist. Um, and, and at the time, the Blues Brothers movie, you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. He was in, uh, he was in, he was in that. And I was like this, you know, 20 year old white Jewish kid from Jersey. And I'm driving along around the country in a Cadillac with a, an old black man born in Memphis who, when he grew up, he had to ride the back of the bus. So it was a, it was a whole, just talking to him was just amazing growth. Um, so that, and, and I, I want to add something to that because at the time in college, I was also studying with Gary Chester. I studied Gary for, this is before the book. I mean, he hadn't even written the book yet. And if, if, I don't know if you know, Gary, um, Gary had, you had to go every week. And if you missed the lesson, you still paid, which I kind of got, you know, but then I was saying, Hey, Gary, can I be on hold? Because I want to, I'm going to go do this tour. And he said, yeah, you can go do the tour, but you got to pay me every week. And I was like, really? What? I mean, aren't you training? Aren't you like, this is what we're supposed to be doing. He said, now you got to, you know, so I ended up leaving Gary. <laughs> that was kind of odd. That's the weird first time thing. I've ever heard that before. That's yep. You had to pay yeah. whether you were there or not. I'm going to have to let you go, Gary. And yeah. I, I, well, I couldn't afford, I would have liked to, but I couldn't afford to do that. I mean, I, I think, you know, Matt's gig didn't pay a lot. It was really... You know, but anyway, so that's why I left. I really thought I needed to get some experience playing. I didn't want to play practice trombone anymore and marimba and all those things. Um, so that's why I ended up leaving. Gotcha, man. At that time when you left Connecticut, you said you were from New Jersey. Did you technically like move back home or did you move into the city or what did you do? In other words, where did you base yourself out of? Yeah. Um, when I went to college, my freshman year, for my freshman summer, I went home that summer. That was the last time I went home to live. Um, and then the next summer, and then I stayed up in Connecticut for a couple of years. Um, I actually lived with Fred also. I lived with, and then uh, a couple other cats who I still know, Paul Maraconda and Rob Aries were both keyboard players in Pelham, New York. And then I got married. I got married in 86 and we bought a house in Yonkers. And I lived there for like 19 years. Um, and we divorced about 10 years ago. And now I live up in, in Somers, which is like an hour north of the city. And I got this whole three acre spread. I built the recording studio and, and uh, it's slamming up here. Beautiful. I saw some pictures, man. Yeah. Stunningly cool. Yep. Yeah. I'm really lucky, man. I live, on, I live in, on three acres, but I'm in the middle of 100 acres that has no... Um, that then you can't build on. It's like protected. Nice. So I'm up here. I can play anytime. I can do it. You know, it's it's awesome. So how busy is the studio um, outside of 
you doing tracks on you know that kind of thing you have projects come in i don't advertise um I, i've had some projects in here but it's it was built really again this is 2007 is when i built this which is a, which again in the recording world is a lifetime in terms of what's affordable and what's you know so it was really built for me to do tracks and stuff like that and that's what i do i have had full bands in here um it's if it's a project that i dig and that i believe in um but it's not like i'm taking um you know i need to get an assistant engineer and all that stuff i don't have any of that things actually at nam show i'm getting ready to purchase an antelope goliath i don't know if you know that piece it's a very powerful software-based interface that's going to streamline my situation here because i've been building the studio now since like oh three in my old house and i keep adding stuff like band-aids and on top of it and it's like it's so convoluted now that I'm the only one that knows the signal path and how to work. You know, I could never bring somebody in here. They, it would be 10 weeks of training. If you think that's convoluted, you should see how we were recording this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, yeah. It's so, uh, so I really want to get it streamlined. So it's easier for me and easier for somebody to come in and assist. And then if that happens, I think I might um, accept some more outside clients. But, you know, the other thing is, <clears throat> for what I can charge for this studio, because the, the huge main studios are charging, like, just a little bit more than me because of all the competition from home studios. Mm -hmm. So, like, for, for 80 bucks an hour to come in here and, and sit here for, like, with some, some band trying to get, like, 30 takes of some crappy thing, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's, that's harsh. <laughs> it doesn't pay enough. It doesn't pay enough for me. I You know, I could teach for more than that, or I could just – you know, do something else. I don't want to lock myself in like that. But if, again, if I get an assistant, um, that'll all change. Gotcha. So, I don't have to be here. So, Joel, one thing that uh, early on when I became aware of you that just sticks in my mind is I kind of feel like you were really early in the game, you know, offering tracks at, uh, at your studio and all that. And it just, you know, it's so common now. So many guys have that ability but years ago you were you know you got into that so obviously the recording and engineering part of it you were fascinated with but do you do are you doing more of that than than anything else in your studio like remote tracks and yeah i'd say my studio is mostly me doing remote uh yeah i would definitely say that mm -hmm. it's most with that and i teach a little bit out of here too cool uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not really set up to have, you know, a lot of people milling around and a band and, and the whole thing. I mean, again, I've done it and I actually dig it. I it, To me, it's amazing when I have great musicians in here to be behind the glass and watch it go down live. Like, you know, because that's magic when you get cats together and it's all everybody can play. And it's like, I love that. I really, I really do love that. Um but again, it you know if only if if it's at a high level, mm -hmm. you know. I don't want to see some. I don't want to just be here while somebody's practicing, even if they're paying me. You know what I mean? It's just it's doesn't it doesn't feed me intellectually or emotionally at all. Yeah. So, uh, Joel, when you put the studio together at your new place there, how much time did you spend and thought as far as like room treatments? you know, the, just basically preparing your room for drums. Well, I hired Larry Swiss to, who has since, uh, he's also passed on, but he was the designer for Bear Tracks, which is the Spirogyra studio, which is, um, that's also gone. Um, and that studio was absolutely un unbelievable. I mean, if you Google, um, it's not Bearsville, which is in Woodstock, which mm -hmm. is still there, Bear Tracks, um, you know, now Rogers would always lock that out. Um, Jonathan Brook, um, uh, Dream Theater, you know, all those bands, they, they they would just use that. I mean, it was a major studio. Um, so Larry Swiss had designed that. And when I moved here, I hired him to um, look at my space and design the whole thing. So th this is a professionally designed studio. The control room is, you know, there's no parallel walls. Uh, 
Uh, you can't see this. I don't have enough a long enough line. Um, but and there's a drum room which is much more live, but there's no flutter. It's got really good energy. I mean, everything's wired. But I mean, so it's not just this. Was, I gutted. This is a three car garage. My cars are underneath, and this is above. Okay, so it was gutted to the to the walls. All the walls were moved, and everything was made. So it was professionally designed, and it sounds like it. Cool, man. And then regarding the gear, I know that you're you're getting ready to do a major studio overhaul there. But just just tell the folks as far as like what are you like what kind of preamps do you use? What yeah. kind of like software do you record with? That sort of thing. Right. Just give everybody an idea. Well, I've been using Digital Performer since the beginning. Um, so and and I really think all the DAWs are are all equal. It's just how fast you are on it. And I, I can fly on DP. I know all the key commands and you know it, um, so really it's it's you know the plugins uh, I'm using all uh, um, you know waves and uh, I'm, I'm sorry not waves but PSP um, I'd have to actually look I have so many. Um, but I'm kind of, I mix in the box, right? I have my, my outboard gear uh, that I, I, I record drums through. I have a universal audio, uh, what is this? It's a, a 2610 for the, for, the, um, for the overheads. And then um, I endorse this company, ADK, which is a microphone company. But for a while, they were making really high-end Class A uh, preamps, and I have eight channels of there. They're, they're custom-made made in america they have they have um op amps which you can swap out like a cinemag or a jensen or or uh so i have eight channels of those those are for the drums um i have an apogee 8016 conversion um and that goes through light pipe into some my, my old mo2 2408 um and that's a transparent pass it's just really a light pipe bridge and um and I have a Soundcraft Digital 328, which is a Soundcraft board, which I'm getting ready to retire when I get this uh, Antelope conversion. Um, the Antelope is going to use the Apogee conversion as well as its own conversion. It's set up for, for both of those. Um, and let's see. I got an Avalon uh, 737 for vocals. Uh, I have Hafler monitors, NS10 monitors uh, uh, with a subwoofer benchmark. Um, D to A converter, Ard, Ard sync clock, and that's going away too because that's a, that's going to be an antelope piece. And a Mac, uh, you know, an old 2008 Mac tower with SSD drives. Cool, man. And then one more thing about studio stuff, and then we'll, we'll go back and do a little bit more career type thing. But for your drum gear proper, like in other words, the stuff that you record with, what do you like to use in your studio? Uh, I have my original Star Classic kit here, the very first one. You know, me and a few other guys developed a Star, helped develop the Star Classic line. Um, so this is the very first kit that I got. I have a prototype, um, which which I actually ended up selling to a student that still has that had Art Star Two lugs on it, but it was a Star Classic shell. And back then they made Star Classic Birch. Mm -hmm. So I used that for a while, but when but when the Star Classic Maples proper came out, um, I took it on the road with Spyro, and then uh, I had it on the road for a couple years, and then a new color came out, so they wanted me to have a different color, so I I I, uh, I took the white one home, and uh, it's been this kit never goes out, and I have all the drums, I have three bass drums, every tom, yeah. um, and it 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 really is killing. Let, let me ask you this. Did you, when you were in the development aspect with the guys at Tommy, did you just hand them like Gretsch drums and just said, do this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they asked, they asked me, um, come on, know, what drums, what drum, you know, it was, it, let me see if I can remember. It was me, Simon Phillips, Rayford Griffin, Stuart Copeland. Um, I might be missing Kenny Arnoff. Yeah. So we were guys that they kind of like say, like, what, what do you guys want? You know, and I told I told the Tama guys like, look, if you want to know, you know, you guys already know this, but all the heavy cats are still using their Gretsch drums in the studio and for records. I mean, they they put, you know, that whole thing with Vinny and the, and the the Gretsch drums with the Yamaha hardware. Mm -hmm. 
that's what cats were doing. Picar you know, so Picaro I, always, yeah. even though the Pearl. I mean, yeah. John, you know, John Robinson. Yeah, yeah, when they were touring, you know, they'd have their, their the stuff. But, you know, when they were really to, ready to do their stuff, they bring out their old Gretsch stuff. So I said, what you guys should make, you know, your drums are too thick. You know, they're too heavy and blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, you want thin maple shells and you want die cast hoops. And then so and basically that's what they came out with with their with the cool the star cast mount system, which was way ahead of its time when that came out. So basically the star classic maple at that time was like a supercharged Gretsch kit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was in heaven, man. I still love them. They're they're killing. Believe me, you don't have to convince us. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it's what we own. So, yeah, yeah, good stuff, man. So right. now going back just to to go back to. You finished playing with Matt Guitar Murphy, and it's kind of, kind of my understanding through reading some stuff that one of your next gigs you were with Pure Prairie League. Is that right? <laughs> oh, that was a blast, man. <laughs> yep. Tell tell us how you got into that. That's the closest I ever got to a pop gig. Yeah. Um, so my friend Jeff Pivar, who's a great guitarist with with Crosby, uh, David Crosby, and uh, I mean he played Ray Charles. He played with everybody. We we. He was from Connecticut when I met him when I was in school, and he was doing sessions for uh, uh, for Pure Prairie League, and their drummer, something happened with their drummer where they, he couldn't make a tour for whatever reason. It was temporary, and Jeff recommended me to sub. It was like 10 dates or something, and uh, <laughs> I got to tell you this story because, again, I'm like a nerdy white kid you know just so nerdy i'm still living this was uh the the, the summer in, in college when i said i went home my freshman year yeah so i got the call and then i was going to meet the bus in hartford connecticut so my mom i put all my drums in this in the station wagon my mom drives me up we're meeting the bus at like 11 in the morning they have driven all night from detroit they did an overnighter and they were going to meet and they were going to pick me up and we we're going to maine so I meet in Hartford, the bus comes up, and, and these cats come out. It was like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. The bus opens, <laughs> smoke comes out, they're like bedhead, and they're like, hey, what's up, man? I, you know, and my mom is like, her eyes are like saucers, like, I'm going to put my son on this bus. <laughs> yeah. um, but it turned out these were the, the greatest cats. Uh, Mike Riley, the bass player who also um, still is managing the band. And Craig Fuller, or actually, at the time, it was, uh, oh, what's Gary's last name? Uh, he's a huge writer in Nashville. Um, wrote big hits for Garth Brooks. And, and uh, Craig Fuller, who actually was uh, took Lowell George's Little Feet. Um, that, that, that was who, who, uh, who was in the band. And I'd never played a band like this. You know, strong vocals. Um, and I overplayed the shit out of it. I know I did, but the <laughs> bass player liked my energy, you know, for whatever reason. Um, maybe he thought it was updating the sound or whatever. And I did that for like over a year, and I had such a good time. These are the first guys that weren't concerned with. They just wanted to have a good time. This is the first gig where I, I could play and actually look at the audience and like. You know the stuff was so simple and so so feel. I didn't have to worry about oh, there's a seven eight thing coming up. There's you know, um, and I I just really enjoyed playing and and uh, it was like a really low stress music for fun. Great cats. I, I mean I I a really great experience. Man, was this was this like your first gig also where? You know, you had you had real like professional musician treatment, like you had a drum tech, you had catering right. in the catering in the green yes. room, you know, that kind yep. of thing. Now, yep. what was your impression? You just left the gig with Matt Guitar Murphy and then you get this thing. That's qu quite a, quite a different gig, I would imagine, just from the, the mindset. Right. The, uh, you know, a absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean. <clears throat> The, the, really, the best thing about it was, you know, so many musicians are so, they're dark and they're tortured because they're always trying to get better and they're like, oh, I suck and, and I got to, you know, these guys were just like, let's just go out there and have fun, you know, mm -hmm. and, and really it's like, 
a lot of the tunes like oonch, 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 you know, they, they it was like a real southern country kind of thing. They had some, you know, like Let Me Love You Tonight was a big hit with Sanborn played played on it. And, you know, I mean, they were kind of getting to that pop thing. But the live show, it was just kind of feel good stuff. And it was, I wasn't thinking about, it was kind of the Ed So versus Randy Jones. I wasn't thinking about man, I got to work this stuff out. I was like, man, let me just make this groove. And, you know, people are smiling and I'm smiling and, you know, everybody's smiling at everybody. That was like a, a new thing because most of the times the jazz guys, you know, they're, they're digging in, ah, you know, ah. it's like that intensity. You know, this wasn't intense. This was just fun and, and musical, which was a new experience for me. So man, when you got that gig and then you met those folks over in Hartford, you had never played note one with them. And then you went to Maine and played the gig. So you had to get prepped a little bit. Did they just say, here, kid, here's some here's some songs. You got to learn this stuff, and we're just going to hack yeah, it out know, on the gig. That's a good question, because I don't remember how I learned the stuff. They, like might have sent me some cassettes. Or something. they might have sent me some cassettes or something, because obviously I learned the tunes. So I must have, yeah. And I did, I did, and I do. I always do my homework. I mean, when, I, when I'm going to a gig... I'm I'm 100 percent prepared, um, and you know uh, the, the 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 end of that story is I was supposed to be doing it for 10 gigs, but they asked me to stay on, so I, I ended up doing it for over a year, a year and a half. And the only reason I left is because of the Michelle Camillo thing, which is again another <laughs> complete <laughs> left turn. Well, there's the segue that I was going to make myself. All Don't right. have to do that now. <laughs> so. <laughs> So okay, so you're with you're with Pure Prairie League, and then all of a sudden you get the call for the 180 degree opposite gig. <laughs> yeah, it could not be more opposite. That's yeah, right. and I mean you go from feel good music to now all of a sudden you got to be on high alert. Every note you have to play stands up straight. That's on right. This next gig. So so how did you get this? How, you you're, you're obviously with Pure Prairie League. How did you get the call? How were you even on the radar for this? Well, like I said, you know, Dave and I are really good friends. Weckle and he had the gig. He got called for Chick. And Michelle, you know, said, you know any drummers? And he recommended me to audition. Not for the gig, but to actually audition. I think they, they listened to, to a bunch of guys, um, or he did. Um, and that's how I got it. And I'll tell you, I Michelle called me and I and I was a big fan because I used to go see Michelle play. He knew who I was, but had never heard me play. I used to go to McKell's and see Dave and Anthony and all the guys, and I was like, I knew all the tunes. Um, I mean, that was a force majeure, that band. I mean, I couldn't believe, you know, it was there was nothing like it happening. So when I got the call, um, it was 10 days before my audition, and I never practiced so much in my life in those 10 days to prepare for that. And I almost bailed at the last minute because I didn't think I was ready. I was just like, you know, it's that there's there's that mentality like it's better to to make no impression than a bad impression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really feel I was ready. I mean, you know, I had to like play this tune. There was this tune called Tombo in seven four, and there's a freaking drum solo, and I couldn't even play in seven four, you know, comfortably. And there was a, you know, and I was like, I'm going to be playing with Michelle, Camillo, and Anthony Jackson in a fucking rehearsal studio. I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified. Um, so I, you know, I tried to prepare and I swear the last, the day before I was almost going to call and cancel, but I ended up not doing that luckily. And I don't know what Michelle heard, but I guess he heard enough to, to, to think he could work with me. And that was the start of that. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, Anthony, I was so self-deprecating for, for the first year in that gig. I'd be like, oh man, I'm so sorry, you guys. It's so great to be you know, Anthony actually took me aside one day and said, listen, you have to shut up with that shit. You would not be here if you couldn't cut the gig. So get over it and just play. You know, because I was so like, I was beating myself up all the time on that gig. So he kind of snapped me out of that a little bit. That never happens with musicians. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst, man. I am. I am. You talk to, uh, I don't know about that. It's it's bad. It's really bad. You know, we Fred said we're kindred spirits, and it's like, other than getting really great gigs, you and I <laughs> really line up. It's amazing. You know, it's it's a tough thing, and it gets 
you know, John, it gets in our way. The the, the lack of self confidence and lack of I I hate you know blowing my own horn and selling myself. Mm-hmm. Like people come up, I watch them. I was like, hey man, you should you know you should call me. I'm gonna ki- I'd kill your gig. You really should give me a chance. Just do- I could never in a million years say that. Not even uh, yeah, it's, just, it's impossible. It's not for my me. personality. I'd rather let my playing do the talking. But if they don't hear me, then I'm not talking. So it's like a catch twenty two. Yeah, that's true. So I, I'm sure maybe I could do more, and I just I'm not can I can't I can't change who I am, and don't want to change that part. You know, it is what it is. Very good, John. I'm I'm not done with this Michelle Camilo thing because oh, this this is man, bringing the, me he's. Man, this is bringing me back He's to my clearly childhood. Clearly, reliving man. trauma here, and you're just gonna keep <laughs> kicking him. Well, I, I I have to ask questions, man. I don't I don't get to talk to him every day. Go, Phil. So, shoot. All right, so Joel, I'm gonna go ahead and, and say this: that I wore out the suntan CD that I bought when I was in school, and I, uh-huh. and and to to borrow a the terminology from John Chalvin, if I had a dollar for every time I played We Three. I, you know, sitting in the practice room working on that, I'd be, I'd be a rich fella. So, the, well, let me tell you, man, the suntan record, like I said, was, was on hot rotation at the school where I was, where I was in school. We used to listen to it all the time, talk about it. Now I've got questions about when you were working with Michelle Camilo, as far as like how you guys did things yeah. was, was Michelle a guy that would hand out charts to you guys and say, we're going to just rehearse the crap out of this stuff or was it a lot more by feel? And then the other the part two to this question is this, when you guys recorded those, those tracks, was that something that you would play a lot live first and then really flesh that stuff out and then go in and record it? Or would it be the opposite? Would you guys record stuff first and then flesh it out on the bandstand? Um, is is the suntan record that had we three? Is that the one that has Caribe on it also? I uh, mean, it's got Tombo and Seven Four. I know it's yeah, got that exactly. on there. I'm mm-hmm. on two songs, but I think it's that's yeah. All right, so I'll tell you. First of all, that record was recorded stereo to two track live. Okay. And I will tell you also for you guys if you can picture this. Uh, it was a double session. We did the whole thing in one day. Weckl did his tunes, and then I did my tunes. I think I played three songs on that. Um, so Dave went first, and then Dave goes back to the control room to listen while I'm playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right? So just put your... I was like, this is not good. <laughs> mm. Live to two track. Um, that's how that went down. Very stressful, I remember. Now, regarding the chart... I can't remember if we played, you know, talking about We Three and man, had we, we? It's very possible we had played it live a little bit, but not a lot, not a lot. Uh, we might have rehearsed it. I, I really can't remember. Um, but there was no overdubbing. There's no nothing. And then the other thing that that I that um. You know, I think we did three or four, three takes maybe. And like I said, Weckl was in there. But Michelle, it was, again, a lot of the two tracks. So he would would take the take that had his best solo, mm-hmm. which obviously makes sense. But I remember Weckl telling me afterward, he said, like, there's there's another take where I was really, he, he said I sounded great on, but they didn't use that one because Michelle might have, you know, blow. And, you know, that's what happens. But um, who knows where that is? <laughs> Mm. But the the fact that Weckl was there was totally freaking me out. Even though he was my bud and everything, and he was never, he was just great. I mean, he you know he is who he is. What are you gonna do? It was really me putting it on me because you know Dave he hears everything. You know he hears everything. So you know you're playing and you go like oh I did that and you go like and then and you know Dave I know Dave heard that. <laughs> 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 That's trauma. I'm reliving that trauma now. I'm in a fetal <laughs> position just hearing the damn story. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, man. Uh, I, to to put a little button on the Suntan album, I'll tell you this: that we would, you know, as young music students would, we would have these listening parties where we would get together and we would play it. And I distinctly remember one of my friends saying at the time. 
this Rosenblatt guy is out weckling weckle <laughs> on some of these. So, I mean, so there's a compliment for you, man, depending no, on how know. you want and, to take it, you know? I heard that it would, I started hearing a lot of that um, and it was blowing my mind. And, and I was like, oh, these people, they don't know what they're talking about. But when I look back now, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of good shit there. I'm proud of that. Um, you should and, be. And my thing is like, you know, Dave is so amazing. And, you know, you listen to what he plays, even back then. Listen, I met him when he was 17. And he came into school playing at such a high level. I can't even, I mean, it's, it was like nothing I've ever heard. Um, and that, again, that's what spun my head around back in 1978. Um, and he's always been a hard worker practicing and, and, you know, his success and his, his, he, what you hear what he plays is, is, is a result of that. And I was really struggling when every time I play, even now I'm always struggling and, and that creates, I think, like drama. You know, it's like it's like, wow, is he gonna make it? What's gonna go on? You know, when you see Dave play, it's he's so fluid and it's like amazing. But I always know when I'm gonna go see Dave, I'm gonna get blown away. But I always know he's gonna it's gonna be great. There's not gonna be like he's not gonna fuck up. You know, in fact, my favorite my favorite hangs with Dave was when we were in college, we used to go do this double drum thing together. And we would get a little loaded. And if he was a little wasted, he was such a blast. And he would be like hey, going for shit and fucking up and laughing. And it was like, it was fantastic, you know? Um, and I still, whether it, whether it is be, be, who knows why, but I'm like more of like that. It's, people say it's organic and, and I'll take that. Mm -hmm. I will take that now, for whatever reason, whether, whether I'm just that like, my technique is not doing what my mind wants to do, but there's like, there's all that push pulling thing, which I would look at as like, I'm fucking up, but in retrospect, it's just being human. Well, there was, there was definitely that record in particular, there was always a buzz about, you know, some people preferred your vibe. It was a little looser. It was a little more organic, whatever. And right. I can remember people saying that stuff and it was kind of like, Man, people just being themselves, but there was a there was a group of people that were way into what you were doing. Well, you know, back then when, when people would say that, I would say, I'm trying to play like Dave. I'm trying to articulate as well as him. And the fact that I'm screwing it up and you're calling it organic was fucking with my head. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. if I could play if I could play with the technique and the finesse that Dave does, you would. I would I would, but I didn't have that. So I did the best that I could. And whatever that is, you know, I really struggle with, with people complimenting me not playing as well as I thought I, I could. You know what I mean? It was like a weird thing. But now it's like, yeah, it is what it is, you know. Yeah, no doubt. Right. So, Joel, how many years were you with uh, Michelle full time? I think it's like three and a half, three and a half to four. Gotcha. Uh, and and uh, I left, well, we left mutually, you know, he was going, Michelle was going way, I started out with playing with the sextet with Anthony, then the trio with Anthony Jackson, then he started going with a more of acoustic bass trio with Lincoln Goins and, uh, and Mark Johnson, and <clears throat> Michelle was really trying to legitimize himself as a jazz player and wanted to surround himself with more jazz guys. And I wasn't that guy. Um, and I didn't want to be that guy, really. Um, and it got really kind of stressful for me. And, and uh, we parted ways, you know, mutually. And then, and then what happened after that? Let me think about this. Then it was Paquito de Rivera, Ileana Elias, uh, Steve Kahn. And I did a lot of jazz with Steve Kahn and Jay Anderson, you know, so go figure. Um, and Iliani also amazing jazz. Um, and then, then the Spyro thing came up and that's, you know, that was the other thing. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Let's uh, talk about that. Because I mean, that, that took up a, uh, that was a significant portion of your career. And dare yeah. I say the reason you're sitting in that room right now. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Say that. That's right. Yeah. So what year did you get the call from, I guess, was it Tom Schumann or? Uh... No. Um, you want to know how I got that gig? 
It's very funny. Uh, Richie Morales had the gig. Yep. Before me, I was just on the phone with Colin Schofield, who at the time was a Zildjian rep, and I was talking to him about whatever. I don't remember why I was calling him, but he mentioned to me that Richie told him that he was leaving the band and that I would be perfect for the gig. And like, I should call Richie, you know? So I ended up calling Richie and finding out, like, first of all, it was kind of weird. Like, is it true? Are you leaving? And, and um, he said, yeah. I said, well, can you put me in touch with the manager or something? Can I, you know, who can I call? It's one of the first times I was actually proactive. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, so basically what Richie got for me is I didn't have to send in a tape. He got me just like, you should just hear this guy. And um, they listened to 15 guys. Uh, they, they narrowed it down to all the submissions they got. They narrowed it down to 15 guys. They did three days of uh, um, uh, a rehearsal studio where they listened to five guys for, you know, for three days so 15 guys they all had to play the same three songs that we all prepared and they, they at the end of each day <clears throat> at the end of the session they narrowed it down to five like who are your top five guys and um this is very cool how they did that so they narrowed it down to five guys and then they made cassettes candidate a b c d or e and they gave the cassettes to everybody didn't say who was who and they said, just put rate, put these cassettes in your 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 first to last, and whoever averaged the highest in everybody's list got the gig. Wow! And that was that, so it was kind of diplomatic how they did it. It was very cool. Very. What year was that, Joel? That was in ninety. Ninety. Yeah. So I auditioned, I think, in November, December of nineteen ninety, and then I started I started for rehearsal in February of ninety one. Cool, man. So now that gig also, if you want to make a comparison between that and say like Michelle Camilo, I think there's there's a couple of interesting interesting likes and dislikes about it. One thing in particular is I don't a, a lot of folks may not be aware. I, I actually saw you aspire gyro one time. A lot of people probably don't realize that if you just heard the recordings, the live version of Spyro Gyro is significantly different. Than, yeah. than, than the recorded had, version. Had nothing, one had nothing to do with the other. Right. And so, I mean, live, they really stretched out and they played like crazy. So that's, so that's I'm sure, similar to, to Michelle Camilo and from, from that standpoint. Now, from the from the opposite standpoint, Spyro Gyro were the proverbial rock stars uh, or of like pop fusion, extremely popular from, from that standpoint. Right. Did, were there more comparisons between that band and say something like pure prairie league from the standpoint of having text and and you know nice catering and that kind of stuff well, in yeah. other words so you have that in common yeah that, that gig when i joined in 91 you know we had a crew we had a truck mm -hmm. we had uh you know we were flying first class to um anything i think flight longer than three hours was was business class or whatever um yeah it was it was it was very good treatment and the first year you know i i went on we did like the six week asian tour you know all the blue notes and philippines and guam and i mean it was so exotic and you know it, it was fantastic it was like a pop gig as about as far as you could go as, as an instrument instrumental band at the time and this is before the smooth jazz thing that was even a name mm -hmm. you know i mean when the smooth, the smooth jazz thing took on, then you had a thousand sax players and a thousand guitar, and it's like every, it really diluted Spyro's impact. And we would never, you know, Jay Beckinsey would never bend to the, the smooth jazz pop thing where you have guys who like they dress up and they wear a cool hat and they, you know, they had all these antics, right? You know, choreography and, that, it, and such. Yeah, it was like a pop gig without without uh, you know they're using tracks and all that stuff. I mean, we would never do that. Um, our band it was a playing band, you know. And and as the market diluted, you know, it started to dry up for us, you know. And things started to go away. The tech, you know, the truck went away, and the you know, so it started to get get a little bit less comfortable. But at the beginning, it was it was I was like pinching myself. I was thirty years old, 
just gotten married. Um, and, and, uh, it was just an exciting time. Really. I remember the, you know, they would send a limo for me to go to the airport. You know, I had my drums and road cases, you know, I'd set up, you know, for a jazz guy, I mean, for the pop guys, this is normal, but for a jazz guy to show up to your gig with your sticks on a snare, ready to go, your, 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 your monitors are already rung out. Everything sounds like God right away. And then you're finished. You leave your stuff and you go hang out, go to the whatever part. And then you, you get, you get on an airplane and show up at the next gig. And then all your stuff that's been drive driven overnight is set up. I mean, it's just, I, I will say I, I never took that shit for granted. I never took it for granted. I really appreciated it. Matt, when you were with Spyro, did you at that time, or were you, I should say, at the time, incorporating any type of electronics, triggers into your oh, rig? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Vin, you know, I just called Tom and everybody. I was like, send me this. You know, I, I was a double pedal owner, not a double pedal player. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, yeah, give me one of those. I'll put it up there. And I had, you know, a whole rack system. I had a full rack of electronics um, because they were carrying all that stuff. You know, I could do really do whatever I want. And I used, I never really, you know, I never really got it down, you know. Um, but I was, I had a couple things. I think there's a video on YouTube of a solo I did um, in the early 90s where I have my whole electronics. And I got like, I using these cat. They were like they were called pole cats. You remember mm -hmm. those? Sure do. So I had those around the kit with like congas on them and some, you know. And I was just like trying to. It was. <laughs> I wish I never did it, but <laughs> I was I was jumping on. And I had some delay on the bass drum when I play a shaker. I you know I dabbled in it, but I never really, really got it totally together. And then when when the, when the um. When our, when we couldn't start, we we had no more truck. We had all that stuff. I dumped all that stuff, um, and so we started really whittling down. Man, at, at any time during when you were carrying electronics and that type of thing, did Spyro ever play with any sequences or clicks or anything? Never, never, never. The closest we came to it is there was this one tune we had at Radio Hit called Ariana, mm -hmm. and the, on the record there was a shaker that went through it uh through the whole thing um so what i did is i put a shaker sample of like um it was like a two bar uh loop but like but like every time i hit the bass it would go like and i would the groove was like and as and i had every time i hit the bass it would re-trigger that that shaker so i would be hearing and through the house whatever um you know that eighth note, so that would keep that. I would have to keep in time, but that's the closest I came to playing with a click, just because every time I hit the bass drum, it would trigger a two-bar um, sample, and then it, I would every time I hit it again, it would re-trigger. You know what I'm saying? So it yeah. didn't keep going. Hold on, let me get rid of this call. Oh, no, I don't have to take that. Okay. Um, all right, so. That's the closest we came. We never did any clicks. We never did. I think I did one drum solo where I had like a little drum machine and I put on like a, a cowbell thing that I play with, but that was short lived. It, was, it wasn't happening. Yeah. So, Joel, there was an article that I read that you had written uh, in Modern Drummer. I guess it was probably the early to mid 2000s when you were making the decision to leave Spyro at yep. that time. Just Tell, tell our folks what, what what went into your decision making process to leave Spyro because I mean that was a great gig. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I really kind of got uh, I I got kind of frustrated with the pop mentality, meaning you know we're we're gonna rehearse ten songs and then play these ten songs for the rest of the year. And Jay ran the band like a pop band. In other words, they were, you know, there's spots to stretch, but different arrangements or different trying to trying to like do other things was kind of frowned upon. Um, and I was cool because I had other things going on and that was fine and everything. And, and but as the band got slower, you know, less work and, and less work, you know, Spyro had a had a no subbing policy. 
which is which is fine. And and they would also have a thing where, you know, they 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 gave you like ninety days, like they wouldn't release you ninety days, um, in case they got a gig. You know what I mean? So. I, as the work was getting less and less and I was getting called to do these other things and I wasn't allowed to do them because, you know, we might get something and then they don't and then I don't have the work. It was start. It was getting harder to afford to be in the band. Um, there wasn't there wasn't enough work and there was a lot of stipulations that I was having trouble with. And I actually I, I went to, to Jay and I said. You know, one of three things has to happen. I either got to get a raise, you know, so that so the gigs that I do, you know, I, I can make enough money or I, I have to um, be able to sub, you know, or and this is what I was really hoping and what the band was really hoping is let's just have a season like, OK, you know, you own us from, you know, March to November, you know, but then from December, then we all have like three months we have that off where we, where we can plan other stuff and do other things. And, and, you know, and he wouldn't do any of those things. Mm. Um, and so I just said, I, you know, I got to go. And it was tough. It was really tough, but, but, you know, look, that band is still playing now. I mean, I could still be in that band. I, you know, I'd like to think I, I, you know, but since leaving, leaving them, I've had so much, other experience played so many other, other other learned different kinds of music and this you know i was really getting stuck in spiral with like the you know that smooth jazz tempo and i'd be doing these other gigs like wow i can't really hold a ballad like at a really slow or i can't play this fast anymore and it was like it was fucking with my head and i said i you know i gotta you know i'm an artist I, you know the, the whole reason that when we when we play is like i want to want to make music i want to play and it's like I'm not built to play 10 songs for a whole year. I wasn't built for that. Mm. And again, like it was cool when, when, you know, I had, I could do other stuff and, and there was enough work, you know, it all balances out, but it, it's, it, it didn't, it started not to make sense for me. And that's, I think the name of the article is when it's time to go, it's time to go. That it was something like that. Right. And really it was just, it wasn't good. I was resenting the gig and, and mm. the, you know, my attitude showed that it wasn't good for anybody. Right. So, so and, and we left. You know, everything is cool. I mean, it, it, it. No bridges were burned, and and uh, I'm on good terms with everybody. It's no, it's no problem. Good stuff. So when, so then you just what, dove back into the New York scene. Uh, work really worked the uh, doing tracks. What was the? Uh, yeah, it took a long time. It took about a year. I remember I made the decision to leave about four years before I left. And during that four years, I took every cent I had and paid down my mortgage because I knew when I was when I was going to get out because I had that gig for so long. People had already stopped calling me. I mean, because oh, you can't call Jolie's on the road. He's he's traveling. You know, I was off the radar, so I knew there would be a good six months, a year where it would take that and that much time to get reestablished, and I didn't want to have, you know. Three thousand twenty five hundred dollar a month mortgage with no money coming in, so I just paid that shit off. Um, and it wasn't until I I was finished with that that I that I left, just so I'd have lower carrying costs, you know. Yep. And then you know you do the thing, you go back. Hey, what are you doing? Oh yeah, are you still where you, you touring? And no, I'm around. Really, but you know you got to tell that story a thousand times, and then you know slowly the shit picks up. You know, and again, I left in two thousand four. That's when I when I when I split. So, what, as things picked up, what were like a one off European tour? I know you do some of that stuff locally. Yeah. Were you doing, you know, things in the city? What? what yeah, it, you know, one of my best friends, Jay Prince, who you know, when when I was in college, Weckl was in a wedding band, the Hal Prince Orchestra, and Jay was was the leader, and then when when. When Weckl got big, when I saw him in Garfunkel and everything, I took that place, mm -hmm. you know, and I was doing the club date thing um, until I started doing, you know, touring and everything. And then when I left Spyro, I was really dry and I called Jay. I said, man, if you have anything, you know, and he was really cool. He threw me a lot of stuff to, you know, kind of get me keep some, some money coming in. 
and, and I still Jay is one of my good friends, and I, I don't do the wedding band thing with him anymore. But we have a a side project uh, because you know, look, I don't know if you know in New York, some of the the club day bands are slamming. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the best musicians. Um, you know, you, you know, you're playing like a Madonna tune with the guys who who actually recorded it with Madonna. You know, that kind of thing. It's it's kind of bizarro. Um, so I do this little club gig with them, um, and it's at a very it's at a, a high level. Um, he's still one of my good friends. So anyway, yes, I got back into the club date thing, and you know, I was taking whatever it, it took, mm -hmm. whatever whatever came, I would take. Cool. So Joel, to switch gears now just a little bit, there was something that I noticed from watching you play back in like the late '80s, and then somewhere. I don't know, man, maybe it's around 2000 or mid 2000s. You had a major technique shift, man. You went from playing traditional grip to matched grip. Oh, yeah. What? That, when, when, that did, was, when did that happen and why did it happen? Yeah, that, that purely happened because uh, of the volume I needed to play in Spiral. Um, and and um, I kind of played like a Stuart Copeland, like an open thumb. I didn't really have my fingers on, on when I was playing traditional. And I was really, th my thumb was really getting sore. Um, and the other thing is I was using electronics on my left, like some pads. Yeah. So, you know, the, the traditional thing doesn't really, it's it's a little harder to get at that stuff. So I went to match group and that, and that kind of developed. And that's, now I'm kind of trying to go back to traditional. I'm kind of stuck between both of those, my left hand. My left hand is all fucked up now. <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's like in between because I keep switching. I don't know what you know. I'm I'm figuring that out. Okay, that's kind of interesting because it seems like the the last few videos that I've seen over the last ten or twelve years or so, it seems like it's all matched grip. But you're still yeah. using using traditional though. Not as much. Yeah. You yeah. know, but I'm still mostly. I would say I'm mostly a a, a matched grip guy. Yeah. Um, but. It's kind of like whenever I'm playing jazz or I'm playing brushes or anything, it's like it's right there. Mm -hmm. um, it just naturally, it's just it just makes more sense the traditional. So but, uh, I, I need to work on it some more. Yeah. So man, you mentioned you mentioned that you teach also. Yep. Do you t keep a consistent teaching schedule, or is it just one of those things where people come to you as needed, or exactly. both? No, I don't have a consistent. I have a few guys. I don't take beginners. Um, I take guys who are gigging. And I mostly work on, I mean, if there's any obvious problems, most of these guys can already play. And, and I'm not, some guys come to me like, hey, man, I heard on the record you did this booga da booga da booga da thing. And I said, we're not talking about that. That's, you know, you need to practice what you use 99% of the time, not 1%. You know, as working drummers, 99% of the time, we're supposed to just keep time, keep good time, make it feel good, paying attention. 1% of the time, we're, we're doing a solo or filling. So look, uh, you know, what do you want to spend time doing? What makes most sense for you? Some wacky lick that you may never lose, use? <laughs> you probably or, lose it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or work on your pocket and stuff. So most of the guys that come here, they can already play enough to lay down a groove. So we work about why does it feel on top? Why is it behind? You know, what can you do? Like, how about orchestrating? You know, like, you, you know, if you play, if, it, if, it's a, if it's a short hit, if it's a short horn hit, you know, you play it on, on a choked hi-hat. If it's a long legato thing, you play it on the cymbal. It's amazing to me... Um, how so many cats, they're just not hearing music. They're not hearing, like, you know, orchestrate the melody around the drum set. You know, like, try and match what you're hearing. You know, so it's really more ear training, pocket, stuff like that. It's not about, like, you know, learning any kind of wacky stuff. Awesome. I feel like, John, that we need to put that last two minutes of what Joel was talking about on a loop. <laughs> because I mean that that's we, we've covered that exact same thing several times on the show. Yeah, I mean I, it's ridiculous. What, one of my one of the things that John and I we both equally have distaste for is that so many kids, so many students will go out and they'll get a lot of their education or a lot of their things that they're working on off of YouTube, and it'll just yeah. be licks. They'll go, "Here is the Vinnie Colaiuta 
you know, flutter lick or whatever. And that's, that's right. all they do. That's all. And, and in so many ways, you it's know, a disservice. It's true. And, but part of it, it's not their fault because they don't have any place to play with cats. That's true. Yeah. All they can do is practice. And listen, if, if I was a kid and that was what a bit was available to me, that's what I'd be doing. It's fun and exciting. It's all that stuff. But I tell everybody, I said, I don't, you know, get some guys and just play. And, and, the other real important thing that I tell drummers is whenever a cat comes here, the next, the first thing I tell them, I said, before you come back to me, I want you to take a lesson with a bass player. And I said, go play with a bass player. I give him a couple guys' names and then see what he thinks about your playing. Because mm. he's your teammate. He's going to be, you know, he's going to say, well, the, you know, he'll say, the first thing he might say to you is like, Try and pick like a groove and play it for like four bars, more than four bars. You know what I mean? Like we're trying to develop a pocket. So if you keep changing, I can't, I can't lock with you. Like they need, a drummer needs to hear that from a bass player. I you think know? sometimes too, that people our age oftentimes lose sight of the fact of something you touched on about kids not being able to play. I mean, I came up where I played five or six nights a week for years. Me too. And it was like yeah, you, you, you're you're developing so much, and you're like you're talking about musical choices and all that. Yeah, Kids I mean, don't have that. You know, the drinking age was eighteen, um, so there was clubs. But I mean, you know, there were so many bars and places to play. There was no DJs yet. There was no karaoke. None of that stuff. It was tons of work. And mm -hmm. and again, you, you you develop your people skills. You develop your management skills. You develop your playing. You develop your, how to how to maintain your gear. You you develop how to get to the gig and not be late. You develop all these things which you need to be a, a professional. You know, it's it's so. You know, now I think nowadays the playing part is the least of your worries. Hey, that's you very know? true. I mean, it's the I mean, everybody can play now. I mean, the bar is so high. You got to have the other shit together if you want to work. You got to have all your stuff together. You got to be, you know, return your calls. You got to be conscientious, and you got to be professional because there's 30 guys that's ready to take your gig, and I'll do it for half your price. Sounds like you know? Nashville. It's everywhere. Sounds like Atlanta. <laughs> no, it's everywhere. Yeah. You know, the whole thing today, kids now expect don't expect to get paid. Mm. They don't expect to be paid. So where does that put me? I'm expecting to get paid. And I deserve to get paid. Everybody deserves to get paid. But the mentality is, you know, all the club owners saying, hey, man, we have an open mic night. Come on and play. So so they don't pay for anybody. And and people get up and, and they, pull, they get set up and play for nothing. And they suck because they're not getting paid. And the audience gets treated to a piece of shit thing. I mean, it's just, it's such a, a catch-22 you know, it's 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 bizarro out there. That's true. And then a, a bunch of people hear that and they're like, "Oh, live music, it's whatever, man." Yeah, that's it's not right. Great. That's it's not good. Let, let's go to the place that has the DJ. Yeah, yeah. So, do you like teaching? You enjoy teaching students? Um, I have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> I'd say, you know, there's been a couple of great things where, like, I see the little light bulb moments, and uh, I do love that. I would say yes that I do I do like it, but that's because I can pick and choose. I, I don't want to be a babysitter. Gotcha, gotcha. You know? I, I know also from looking at your website that you have a series of of play alongs as well. Yeah. Uh, regarding those play alongs, is that something that you actively teach as well, or is is that something that you just kind of let students work on on their own? Yeah, I don't teach. You know, again, the play along thing is that's a YouTube thing. There's a million of those. Like they don't need me for that. Gotcha. You know. If they come in here and they want to play it for me and I can give them some uh, some uh, some feedback, that's fine. Um, but a lot of times I'm asking them, okay, like, okay, you, what what are you working on in your gig and that's giving you trouble? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you, you know, and they'll bring something in and they'll, they'll show me a video or play me something and we'll work on something that they can use that night or the next gig, you know? So, you know, my thing is really, it's a practical thing. It's not... And it's not a maintenance thing either. I'm not giving you exercises and I'm not giving you, I mean, most of the guys, they don't need that stuff. So it's just like, you know, wh what's a different way to approach this groove? What's a different way to do this? What's, you know, that more practical kind of thing. Cause that's how, that's how I play. I think I'm like a practical, 
you know, meat and potatoes kind of guy in terms of drumming, you know? Sure. Yeah. And and I, I'm, I'm guessing also that especially somebody who's been doing this for years, John and I have said the same thing over and over again. If somebody asks me what I practice, you know, I'm not breaking out method books. You know, I've done all that. I've been through all that stuff. It's primarily, I, I would assume that your practice is also, you're working on stuff that you have to work on for gigs to learn for gigs, that type stuff. Yeah. My, I, I'm a, I'm a horrible, um, self motivator. I don't practice. Um, and, and that's fucked up because I should, I should, but what I do, I take, when somebody calls me for something that's going to require a lot of work that I got to prep, I take it. Um, you know, I, I, I sub on the Hamilton Broadway show mm -hmm. and that is a fucking bear to get together. That's the hardest thing I've ever prepared for. And again, there's no rehearsal for that stuff. And there's, there's a lot of prep work and there's a lot of technique. There's a lot, you know, and, and as stressful as that was, I relish that. I mean, that put me behind the kit for a month straight, like just hitting it, trying to get that together. So that benefits my playing in other arenas. True. You I know? think, I think it also has, uh, just the sense of accomplishment because you and I are a lot alike in that, you know, no, I'm not a big practicer, right. I'm not terribly self-motivated, but given you know, something, a task at hand. It's the fear of sucking, John. That's very true. It's the fear of embarrassment on the gig. That's a huge motivator for me. It really that helps. Really, that really is. I mean, I, I have so much to prepare for in the next few days. I'm doing this Santana tribute at the Bitter End on, on, uh, on Monday. We're doing the entire Abraxas record. Mm. So I'm trying to, and those things are, th those are difficult tunes because you know, they're not really super tight. There's like, you know, it, the feels are weird and this, you know, so it's it's a great challenge for me. I'm also doing this big band that's um, on Sunday, which is like a, a, you know, I mean, there's homework to do, but like that's going to put me up there at the kit and, and get it done. And then, you know, your chops and everything stay stay fresh by, by, uh, by osmosis, you know. Yes, sir. So I'm always taking gigs. I'm never turning down stuff that's at a high level. I don't care how how difficult it will be for me. I just want to take that. I want to take it on. Cool. Joel, we're going to start powering this thing down, but just a couple last things we wanted to run by you. Um, aside from like these these up and coming like near term gigs, do you have any like larger global type things that you're you're working toward in future plans? I know your studio is also one of them. Yeah, the studio is going to kind of keep going. I'm I'm trying actually to diversify. Um, I'm kind of a car guy, so I've been buying some classic cars and flipping them and uh, making some money doing that. And because what I'm trying to do, you know, because I'm not a writer, I don't have any mailbox money. Mm -hmm. um, everything I do, I got to have the sticks in my hand. I'm 56 years old. I had back surgery a couple years ago. I, you know, like I, I'm sensing my body is kind of trying to tell me stuff. So I want to be in a position where I don't have to gig. You know what I mean? So in order to do that, I need other sources of income. So I'm kind of planning, planning for that. I, I, I always want to play music because I love playing, not because, you know, I, I got to eat. You know, and as I get older, that's going to be harder for me if my body, you know, look, everybody, the drummers that I know, I just saw Simon Phillips. And you probably know I saw him at NAMM, but he had a thing. He was playing with Hiromi and he had to he had to leave because he had a health problem. Um, Anthony Jackson also like and, and a lot of my 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 friends, you know, they're they're it's getting hairy out there and they don't have any other source of, of income. And it's scary. You know how many how many GoFundMe's have you seen where like oh so and so's in the hospital and they need all your you know it's like to me I, I although I I have empathy I'm also saying that's bad fucking planning. That's <laughs> true. You know and and uh, you know the way I was brought up with my dad and 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 my my parents it's just like you know you gotta you gotta plan you gotta know you have to value. You know, you got to know what a dollar is. It sounds so cliche, you know, coming from a Jewish guy, <laughs> you know, but it's just like, I, you know, 
I'm trying to plan for my future as a musician, but also, you know, do, doing other things. And the other thing is, you know, I, I'm I'm really diverse in things that really juice me. Music is one of those things. There's some musicians that that's the only thing that gets them out of bed in the morning. Mm hmm. You know, and that's for me, it's not that it's it's you know, it's it's a great gig, obviously. But there's other things It's like me taking getting my motorcycle and going up to Maine and me, you know, we're restoring, you know, rebuilding the carburetor on blah, blah, blah. Those things feed me, you know, so I'm very lucky in that it's just not music for me. Um, so, I'm, you know, in, in keeping with who I am. I'm a diverse person. I'm also trying to diverse ha, ha, um, have my income be a little diverse as well. And I'm, I'm actually in, trying to figure that out now. Cool. So, Joel, with that in mind, then, is there anything that you would like to promote or like to tell the, the, the folks here about they're listening to the podcast to like come to your website, your play alongs, anything like that you'd like to put across? Yeah, I, I, I have a bunch of play alongs. Um, at, at uh, playalongjazz.com, which is run by my good friend Vinny Valentino. Who's a, I don't know if you know Vinny's great guitarist with Vital Information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so my playalongs are there. The video playalongs are there. And there's also a lot of just um, audio playalongs. Um, and in terms of gigs, you know, if they go to my website, there's, you know, my stuff that uh, that I want people to know about <laughs> is on is on the uh, is on the website. And I have, uh, I'm going to be starting another trio project with Vinny and Baron Brown. We're going to start, uh, we've actually already recorded it, but we just have to finish it. That'll be available on my website. And when it is, you know, um, I'll try and send out an email or I'll just put it on the front page. Um, I'm really bad about that self-promotion thing. Um, but, you know, I don't have anything that that's, I'm just like one of those working stiffs. I got a lot of different gigs, a lot of different projects going on at the same time. And I, I, I love that. The, the whole diversification. I know I use that word a lot, but but I'm realizing that's kind of what I dig. I'm not, I'm, I don't get bored that way. Well, I think it's sound advice for the future, especially with young people, because mm -hmm. this business, you have to get in that mindset, the way yep. things are going. And I don't think that's going to change. So right. sage advice, sir. Yeah, and don't be don't be buying Ferraris the first big check you get. <laughs> yeah, you know, Joel. Also, stay in touch with us, man. When you get those projects done, we'll be happy to also put them up on our uh, our All page right. as well. You know, so everybody right, can good. can keep in touch with you. So, yeah. and then you've already given a lot a lot of great advice to the listeners out there. But is there anything else that you might want to put across to either young musicians or even seasoned musicians that uh, would be that you would think might help them out? Yeah, uh, I will say this, and, and it sounds really cliche, but, you know, live, enjoy your life. Live your life. You know, if there's an opportunity to do something um, that you've never experienced, and I'm not talking music. I'm talking about somebody saying, look, we're going to go on a barefoot cruise and blah, 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 and then you have to miss some gigs. Um, you know, those are experiences that they don't come – they. They don't come off, and you should and and you should take advantage of that. I mean, I missed a lot of things. It's like, oh no, I got a gig. I I got I got to practice. I got to do this, and I would uh, and I regret I regret that stuff. Live your life. You know, music is not brain surgery. You know, it's an organic thing. Um, it'll be there when you get back. Um, you know, it's like the classic thing. Nobody ever every when they're when they're on their deathbed, nobody ever says, oh, I wish I worked more. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know, it's just like it just I'm trying to do now, you know, I, I have less of a problem now saying no. I mean, I used to take everything, you know, you were so conditioned. The calendar's blank. I got to work. I got to work. I got to work. And you take everything now. You know, now I don't really have a problem just saying, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'd rather do this. I'd rather do, I, I'd rather hang with my girlfriend or I'd rather blah, blah, blah. And it's just it's a little more peaceful feeling than the anxiety I had, you know, 20 years ago when I was just trying to make it and just, I got to be practicing. I got to be, I got to get better than so-and-so. I got to do that guy. You know, it's, it's stressful, mm -hmm. stressful. So listen, I did my burn, you know, I did the practice burn when I was in my twenties where I did eight hours a day and I had no life, you know, and you got to do that to get yourself to a certain level. 
But it, but at the end of the day, you still got to be a member of the human race. You know, you got to be an interesting person. If you're not an interesting person, you're not going to be an interesting player. And the only way you can be an interesting person is if you experience the world and people, you know. So that's what I would say is like, get off, get off the freaking YouTube thing and just go play Frisbee with your dog or something. I love it. And that's great stuff. Joel, man, you've been unbelievable, man. Thank you so oh, much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we're done, but we're not quite done with you yet. We have, we like to have a little fun on this show and we've had a little bit of fun with all of our guests doing what we like to call the drummers weekly groove cast Rorschach test. And basically okay. what this is, is we have sent off to the drummers weekly groove cast think tank, a little bit of information about yourself. And they have sent back 20 quick questions that we would like to ask you. And we don't want you to overthink this. Okay. They're real simple questions. They're yes, no type things. It's like, for example, I would, might ask you Coke or Pepsi, and you would just not think about it and say Coke or whatever your favorite. Okay. All right? I'm so ready. The important thing here is don't overthink this. So John, John is going to start the clock. Just go. <laughs> I, I hate that okay. start the clock crap. All right. Ask him the question. All right. So here we go. You ready? Yep. Wood tip or nylon tip? Wood. Mounted floor toms or floor toms with legs? Mounted. Chick Korea, electric band or return to forever? Mm. I got to say electric. PC or Mac? Mac. What's your favorite symbol? Uh, I, I got too many of them. Bad answer. Anyway, go on. <laughs> uh, Zildjian, a Zildjian. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Elvin or Tony? Wait, I'll go back. Okay. Favorite, the favorite ride, special dry light with three rivets, 21. Got it. Elvin or Tony? Elvin. Text or phone call? <laughs> Text. Okay. For snare mic, SM57 or anything else? 57. When you're on tour, buses or planes? Now, definitely buses. Barbecue, pork or beef? Uh, pork, medium. Gotcha. Click track or no click track? Wow, I'm split totally on that. I love them both. We'll take it. Okay. You're, you're from Jersey. Do you believe in the legend of the Jersey Devil? I never heard of that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. There's a guy from the mm -hmm. South thinking mm -hmm. he knows it all. <laughs> Come on, man. Marimba or vibraphone? Marimba. Metal snare or wood snare? Wood. Coffee or tea? Coffee. When you read charts, do you prefer overwritten charts or underwritten charts? Over. All right. Green room catering. Do you eat the food or take money and buy real food? Eat the food. Books, fiction or nonfiction? None. In ear monitors or wedges? Uh, in ears when they're right, but that's rare. Most important question we know your first love is trumpet. Maynard or Bill Chase? I got to go with Maynard. <laughs> All right. There you have it, folks. <laughs> Joel Rosenblatt. All right. All right, man. Well, I. I have to say, Fred was right in that Joel and I are kindred spirits because many of his answers would have been mine. But more importantly, this is the least amount I've talked an hour and a half in like 25 <laughs> years. I think I have a man crush on or something. I don't know. But I'm like, I, if I just stood back like an idiot, Joel, it's not that I'm indifferent. I no, love I never, you, man. No, no. I'm no, just like, so. uh, <laughs> <laughs> duh. Okay. Uh, it's all good. I remember John when we met, and we just met for that short time. That we we definitely we had we uh, like you said we connected. Yeah, man. It's a bromance, man. And you know when it. you're really comfortable with somebody, you don't have to talk. We can just look. You know. That's yeah. true. That's very true. <laughs> I'm I'm so fl I'm flattered. That's so awesome. <laughs> man, I 
I'm blushing over here. I feel like I'm in the middle. I'm a third so wheel. Much. What's going on? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm old and tired. We're just talking about it. I'm not going to do anything. Right. Great. Joel, fantastic, man. We really right. appreciate you spending some time with us. All right, John, you got anything else you want to say? Thank you, my friend. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Oh, yeah. All right, all right, guys. Until next week, next Monday, we'll see you with a brand new uh, show. John, say bye to the folks. Have a good one. Listen to this man's advice. Live your life. Live your life and call me. February sucks. <laughs> Once Sorry, again. man. That's my self-promotion for the day, Joel. S snowstorm. All right, John. Joel, say bye to the folks. Bye. Nice, uh, great chatting, and uh, I wish everybody the best. All Thanks, right, man. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. How about that Joel Rosenblatt? I loved it, man. I really, uh, I'm not kidding. My man crush kept me at a distance. D did you not find humor and whimsy in my man crush regarding the Suntan album and We Three? I got to relive my childhood. Yeah, man. It was, he was like squirming after a while. I was like, what are these <laughs> freaks, man? What is up with these freaks? Sometimes there are times you wish that there wasn't any video involved with that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. All right, guys. Well, look, as always, we appreciate you listening. And, uh, you know, we do like to have a lot of fun on this show. Uh, but we do want to bring things down to earth just for a moment. It's, um, it's not lost upon us that uh, we did lose one of the great drummers of our time. Uh, just in the past day or so, we learned of the passing of Almond Brothers founding member Butch Trucks. And so we would like to send our condolences out to the Almond Brothers family and all of Butch's family as well. Uh, yes, Butch, the glue, the foundation of that band will be sorely missed. Thank you so much for inspiration beyond anything we could say. Yeah, it's kind of kind of strange, man. Just in the last month, we've had to uh, do little in memoriams a couple of times here with uh, uh, Alphonse Mouzon and now Butch Trucks. But such is life, right? It is. Both in better places and uh, will very awesomely live in our memory by way of the incredible music they left behind. Yeah, that's one of the positive things that, that with the folks that do pass these days, we seem to have more media, whether it be audio or video, available than, than ever before. So we do have that left of Butch Trucks and Alphonse Mazan. So, all right, John, my friend, I'm going to say that this was a successful show. I love it, man. Yeah. Thanks again to Joel yeah. Rosenblatt. Big thanks to Joel Rosenblatt. By the way, the, the music that you've been hearing going into and out of the podcast our tracks that Joel played on, he uh, uh, even referenced some of them in the show and, and sent us some things. So by all means, stay in touch with Joel as well. He mentioned at the end of the show that you can go to his website where you can stay abreast of all of his comings and goings. So reach out to him. Say you heard about him here on the show. When you go see him at gigs, tell him you love the groove cast and all that he brought to the show. We appreciate you guys. As always, stay in touch with us. And if you would... When you go to iTunes, please, pretty please, pretty please. The reviews are building. We appreciate it, but we need more. We've got to catch up with these other folks out there. So when you go into iTunes, please leave us a kind review. Five stars. We would appreciate it. All right. Till next Monday. John, I will see you on the flip side. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>